quietude requires upper rotation, not side rotation. It requires a palm that supported high and a wrist that is low and the straight tips of the short fifth and thumb on each ending of the hand touching the key in a way that it allows to immediately rebound and return so that you can have the most direct trajectory it would be the extension of what the Alberti bass used to be the stretch between the thumb and the four vertical fingers in a way to obtain an arpeggio that not only spread over the 10th, 11th, 12th and beyond but also the thumb portion of the left hand the pattern and this pattern is very much a wavy it's managed to um, merge with the right hand's eighth notes. So it could create a secondary voice, a rather harmonic root in the fifth, tonic and dominant of F minor, create the, so to say, the um, ground harmonic ground or resonant carpet clang tape it's almost like um, when you play on empty streets in Bach and you um, have this um, the resonance naturally because of the harmonics the fifth in this case here and the tenth in the order of the upper tones so even with very little pedal this fifth resonates a lot and overlaps in richness of resonances for its harmonics portion of the arpeggio pattern. It's always Chopin has these fantastic patterns in the accompaniment that are complex yet so pianistic they almost like fit rightfully like a glove. You can see here and imagine that the composer was a pianist uh, thinking through the fingers. this um, Chopin hand according to the plaster made on his deathbed and she told me to always keep it with me it was sort of like an initiation into music gift when I started studying in Paris seven year old besides that we went to the cemetery in Paris where Chopin's grave is. But what I noticed the most interesting is that between the thumb and the second finger he had a very developed muscle which um, demonstrates these patterns of accompaniment that he designed where the thumb goes further into the territory of the right hand. rotation develops that with articulation practice of hold and poke like you hold the C and then you push on the A flat or on the F of course you cannot have the same stretch between 4 and 5 because their vertical fingers thumb is horizontal 
playably diagonal to be most uh, effective in the articulation of equality, evenness with the other flower. So that it becomes sort of five hands, five fingers hand that is, well, the thumb in the stretches needs to be more or less straight to also touch with the same amount of um, um, cushion skin um, for the vertical and the horizontal finger. Also, not to forget that the lower register of the pianos is heavier by the action. So then the fifth finger needs to strengthen its projection from the articulation of the knuckle itself under the palm. And so you can use the middle finger to hold the note, the pivotal note, in this case the C, and then... But don't use the arm, just use the finger trigger from the articulation of the knuckle. In the beginning, it's not going to be very stretched and not very loud. It might be just piano. But with time, you will strengthen it. It won't become like the thumb, although in some developed technique exercises, one can reach such kind of situation where you try to make even the fingers that from birth are uneven. And also independent which from birth are not either, because the tendons for 4 and 5 is a common tendon than 3 and 2. So Chopin, in his etudes, uh, develops a lot that work on stretch and retract uh, to get a flexible hand, yet strong palm, but flexible fingers. And of course, flexible wrist and arm, not to have it in the 90s. It's difficult to practice the etudes because if you play only the pattern of the opening few bars and you stop and you start and you work just like that by spots, by sections, by subsections it's like series of sprints but no marathon where the endurance is the hardest situation that's where you realize the importance of having the natural weight of the shoulder muscle relaxed into releasing its natural weight to the elbow and then projecting to the palm and then the fingers articulating um, directly from there and therefore not taking tension of tendons and muscles up all the way to the shoulder and be stiff like Pinocchio <laughs> but be very flexible until the palm from the palm down straight fingers straight and, and and deep quickly in the keys. That's very important. So even if you play piano or forte, to always go very fast deep in the key. You don't go slower dipping in the key because it's softer, like a caress versus a slam or this. <laughs> it is not always intuitive, to say the least because obviously we feel naturally playing loud, so we do fast down, but if we go slowly, we think we play softer, which is true, except we don't, since the action of the keyboard, especially in the left hand, most of the time in the lower register of the basis of the piano, the mid-range of the piano, compared to the high register, where the action is so light that it plays without effort. Here, it has to play, um, with a certain effort of speed of depressing the key, straight finger supported by the palm, and all that piano dynamically, without holes or without unevennesses. And of course, most practiced exercise is the rhythm. I, of course, advise very often the First step is the hold and poke. So it would be this. So that each individual articulation and lifting of fingers after the fingers played is entered in the muscular cognitive memory. So you don't have gluing fingers, nor you have holes that 
fingers don't speak because the key is uneven or heavy, or heavier than another because not all the keys on the pianos we play are evenly adjusted in terms of the action unless the piano is brand new. And so we have to have a technique that allows to be um, confident that uh, most of what we want will come out as we wish. <laughs> well, that's the daydream of any pianist, isn't it? And therefore the hope for the teacher to give them that capacity through piano technique to become confident on stage or in a uh, room that when they ask a certain dynamic range with a certain articulation, with certain um, pattern, you obtain it. <laughs> of course it's easier to play loud than soft because if under a certain dynamic of softness you don't push enough or fast enough or deep enough the keys because some of the fingers are longer, others shorter, weaker, etc. So by the time you equalize the balance of the hand, the transmission of the energy between the fingers uh, supported by the muscular palm of the hand, and then uh, this um, very uh, monitoring, uh, almost like a bow for a string player um, arm that allows to um, be precise in the articulation, in the it's almost cherry picking each note precisely as you want it. And if the piano is heavier or heavy uneven keys, your push touch support of the um, technique that allows you to go deep inside gives you a sense of confidence that no matter what piano I'm playing is going to come out. And as I want it mostly. So of course then comes the pedal. If I use the pedal, I sort of smear by insurance in case something goes wrong <laughs> but then it's too foggy and the point of the etude is to show that we can manage to control all this articulation <laughs> so without pedal it sounds drier but of course you could also use a bit of finger pedal will then balance with the non legato eighth notes tenuto of the melody. Of course, Chopin didn't write this etude for the melody, he <laughs> wrote beautiful melodies, but for the etude it's more about, of course, for the left hand and the stretches. <laughs> I was saying earlier, that's the problem. It's not good enough to just be able to play 4, 8, 12, or 16 bars or one page. That's to play the four pages. In some sections, he really goes for the... Um, like an ascension, where you gallop above and you pass over obstacles almost each beat. Or each hemiola beat. Uh, It's easy to, and one shouldn't um, make fun of that, to catch a tendinitis by practicing the technique to acquire on the etude by Chopin. I have other work on the left hand etude by um, Moskowski. <laughs> Less iconic, of course, than Chopin for Moskowski, to be called so. But step by step, teaching wise, I think it's good to not try to um, gather the technique for the etude from the etude itself, because if you practice it many hours, you're going to keep your tendons so tense that they won't replenish uh, naturally, and you'll have to wait and restart later. And so it's difficult to dosage the amount of stretch and retract that you can do until your muscular memory memorizes it. Not, but the precision, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the fifth, and the, the octave, the ninth, and then the very disposition and the very balance that you can obtain in a slow tempo too. That's what the dotted rhythm does really. sense 
of the, it's like a sample when you taste the sample of what the articulation should be throughout the etude because the 16th notes in the left hand flow non-stop <laughs> and you have to do it just like when you train I guess uh, in the gym is to do little by little incremental of course you have to be disciplined and monitored um, it's boring to practice because it's repetitive it's fascinating to practice if you're focused on um, self-learning how to um, uh, approach the uh, betterment of my technique and how to assess it but then when, once you get possessed by that, you don't have a reason to stop until you feel like you manage to dominate the troubles. But in fact, it will eat you before you eat it. So my advice is to always practice by not more than a page at a time once you know the notes and take breaks and then go through the page again under tempo without pedal you could practice also the dotted rhythm with the right hand and make sure always when you return to the fifth finger which plays every downbeat the bass note that you don't drop the wrist, and you don't try to fetch it with a flat finger because it's sort of tempting to be more secure since it's a weak and short finger but it has to play with the tip as much as the other ones and um, it's better to secure the stretch than to try to uh, bend towards it because if you do then you lower the wrist and you have to rise it again to go to the thumb and it creates again the unevenness of that gesture that you don't want to do it's not oscillating it's um, upper rotation it's just vertical it's you do this instead of around nor around and above of course and it sounds like a fast paced barcarolle if it was turn in the accompaniment in that waviness and um, when he modulates uh, uh, he stretches the hands in a way that you have to fetch further bass notes with a shorter fifth finger that means that instead of um, trying to grab them from the trunk and to the hand uh, stretching sideways because the fifth finger won't be long enough in fact it's the shortest to catch the next bass to anticipate and prepare to position the arm to be in front of the wrist and not on the side from the middle when the bases are deeper and deeper, lower and lower in the um, keyboard. And so that you position yourself so that you're always in front of the keyboard's um, wrist with the arm and not on the side. This way you don't have to fetch, but you prepare and anticipate. <laughs> the right hand meanwhile rises so then you end up by appearing from outside like somebody who is rowing on a boat and so it does not aesthetically look very nice I must confess but it doesn't pull on the tendons and it allows to be in control of the sound quality besides the precision of the notes which of course we all want first and foremost compared to the center of the keyboard where you're sitting in front and all of a sudden you go like this, in fact you go like this. And if you anticipate with the elbow before you go the further further down or further further up, in right or left hand, then you obtain this capacity to anticipate so that you have um, to be again in control just like as if you play. <laughs> And 
it's tempting to do because um, um, we don't always put together in the uh, cognitive memory the hand, the arm, um, the elbow, of course, um, the shoulder and the elbow. I mean, everything is normally coming from the neck down to the released uh, shoulders. The back support, lower back support, that allows you to feel like whew, you can play on exhale, in exhaling. <laughs> as well as uh, and that is very important for all the second page I'll give you an example so every time I had the fifth finger in the left hand pattern of the accompaniment still stretched like in the beginning. I stretch to the left my elbow so that I can be ready for the I mean my shoulder. And that uh, pulls less on the tendons than if you do it on the side and try to grab rather than anticipate and prepare. So um, it's technique, uh, it's pragmatic technique, it's thinking before you do the gesture and repeat it until you memorize the gesture so that in performance it goes on a sort of an autopilot. Yeah, and it's difficult to um, monitor all the aspects technically and put together the two hands of course in performance but repetitivity can be boring but repetitivity when you can see the result um, in terms of accuracy and articulation quality of sound, not to mention balance between the two hands, then you feel in charge. You feel like, okay, I can play this etude. I, 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 it's not just like I can play here in this section, but those sections are a little bit in some spots I'm not comfortable. You cover every area and you memorize the disposition that optimally um, brings you to play best each section. Yeah. So in the third page of the cap, he uses mostly the octaves of the right hand for the melody, and then towards the fourth and last page, he starts the coda. <laughs> He uses the ostinato, fastinato, fstinato on each first and third um, eighth note, or because it's six eight, or first and second beat every dotted quarter. But then he starts. This is a ninth and an octave above it. So he tries to uh, go fast in the same tempo as the opening and stretch to the maximum. scale in the left hand, he goes directly the jump. And um, that's where you have to be so that uh, you can land on the pivotal finger and immediately um, address the thumb, but when the stretch with the fifth finger is further because of the, of the dissonance here, minor ninth, which is way more than the other fifth. Then you organize yourself so that you anticipate the gesture. The repeated notes are very difficult to do. Of course, it's easier to do by uh, lifting and switching fingers. But it sounds very um, agitated or overly crisp. 
if you can repeat the same finger without to get tense in the wrist you can define two down three up and not do that much high and up uh, and down of the wrist because it's of course uneven and if you change the finger under it if he didn't want that, besides his pianissimo, how do I know he didn't want that? <laughs> because he told me. No, of course not. But the point of the story is that um, the expression when it's octave, or single not, which is repeated, is that in the octaves. No, you could do 5-4-5-4, five, four, five, four, which is not advisable because you'll end up playing... I think it's better to play one thrust with one five. And then lift the wrist on the last one, which is on the second beat. The repeated notes are a technique which is very peculiar and bizarre and um, everybody has a different handle on it. It's so much connected to the morphology of the wrist, of everything, of each person. But it is true that uh, with a tense wrist you can do two, but not three or four. And let less in a row. So he asks for tissimo for the octave, the heroic scream, and then pianissimo is an echo of it. Of course, it's not an etude for the right hand, nor for the repeated notes here. <laughs> there are others for that. But this one is for the left hand, for the flexible left hand, for the light left hand, for the precise left hand. In terms of stretch, retract, precise, precision, balance of the uh, hand itself and uh, obtaining something extremely flexible in the resonance so that you don't need too much pedal. Even if I don't believe that the pedal is a problem, it just it shouldn't be universal glue. It should be there a coloring or uh, like a sauce when you cook. But uh, you have to first make sure all the ingredients are there and you can hear them individually in every tip. Professors of piano have always developed different types of techniques, exercises for each of those etudes. Mostly repeated notes of double legato or rhythm, memorizing patterns. But the only thing that matters is in, in order to have the capacity to last through it, the etude without to be stiff, is that you have to do it by increments, patiently playing and not getting discouraged when the sun castle is destroyed by the first wave and the next day you start again and it seems like you've never even done it when you thought you reached a certain level of capacity in the repetitivity of the practicing the day before if you did practice every day this etude, let less if it's with days in between. It's not so accumulative, not not obviously accumulative as we hope it would be or stay in our cognitive memory. So it's a combination of um, determination and um, focused concentration and smart um, management of the time with the breaks so that you don't push yourself to the point to which you might learn it well, but it might give you a painful arm and tendinitis of sorts. That you want to avoid. As a teacher, that's what I want to avoid. But as a pianist, I think you should too. Everybody has different ways to practice. The end result matters. The tempo, the resonance, the precision, the cleanness. Yes, but the quality of the sound, the phrasing and the capacity to 
organize all this technique within a purposeful performance, I think it prepares you to insert this kind of sections in other pieces that Chopin or other composers wrote with such accompaniment that has open intervals in quick uh, articulation. Thank you.